Welcome to Fantasy Football Today. DFS, my name is Sia Najad. I am here for our Thursday game-by-game preview with Mike McClure. We've got some news before we get into this 11-game slate. Uh, I'm so eager to attack it, but I do, Mike, I got to ask you, we just had the Jamar Chase news come come across the wire, if you will. Uh, your, just, your just initial reaction to Jamar Chase being out, it looks like at least four to six weeks with some sort of hip injury. Yeah, it's not good uh, for a number of reasons. Number one, I don't get to play him again uh, for a while, so that's unfortunate. Number two, this news broke today and not on like Sunday, so pricing for the Monday Night Football slate, not out yet. We don't get big advantages on the showdown slate, but really, in all seriousness, uh, awful for him, uh, awful for the Bengals who, you know, whether they were actually really good or just had two really good matchups, seemed to be hitting their stride. Um, Higgins was dealing with an injury. It looks like he's fine and ready to go at this point. So it, it's unfortunate, but I hope that he, he's able to return later in the season and still let them potentially push for a wild card spot. Um, you know, maybe they can still win the division in this spot. I don't know. Uh, but definitely a big loss, uh, to that offense for sure. For sure. And, you know, these hip injuries are tricky, right? We're not exactly sure what the extent of the hip injury is. I, I did just kind of rummage on Twitter for some of the the doctors that I follow or the MDs that I follow who usually give out some of this news. And, you know, I did hear the word and I, and I wish I could attribute this to somebody, but I, I, it really was speculative. So I don't know that they'd want me to attribute it to them, but torn labrum was something that was mentioned by some of these guys on Twitter, which, which you know, you know, it wouldn't be a great scenario. And so, you know, in terms of rehab and, and, and sitting out in the, in the time frame and all that. So it's just something we're going to have to monitor, but it's really just a shame. I mean, Jamar Chase is just one of those guys week to week, almost like Justin Jefferson, you know, one of these guys that can just turn, you know, an otherwise sort of average game into something extremely exciting just based on one play or two plays, or in Jamar Chase's case, usually three or four plays. And and it's just really too bad. Uh, but I'm sure he will be back healthy eventually. The other piece of news, speaking of receivers, might not be a big piece of news to some people, but people in Kansas City, who, by the way, don't like me right now because – I tweeted out something about the Kansas City Chiefs before the season, basically suggesting that I thought the Broncos would be better. I thought the Chargers would be better. I thought the Chiefs would take a step back. Apparently, that's the worst piece of analysis of all time. The, the idea that Tyreek Hill could leave that team and Kelsey turning 33 and, you know, the defense being, you know, looking kind of, you know, just average. The idea that somehow uh, they would be eclipsed by Russell Wilson and the Broncos and Justin Herbert and all his acquisitions on both sides of the ball. The idea that that wouldn't be the death knell for the Saints, uh, excuse me, the Chiefs, uh, apparently makes me a, just a huge idiot. With all of that said, Kadarius Tony is on this team now. Mike, my, you're a Kansas City Chiefs fan. We all know this receiver core. I mean, I, I think it's fair to say outside of Kelsey, this is a very average receiver core, if that. Kadarius Tony makes them very, very interesting, right? Very, very interesting. And I do like the way you word it. It is pretty much an average receiver core. It's got guys that have flashed a ton of upside at points in their career. They've all landed in a great spot because they have one of the best quarterbacks and a very creative offense in general. That's what I'm most excited about for Kadarius Tony, though. He's very similar to Tyreek Hill in ways. I mean, it's we want to compare anyone who's fast like that to Tyreek Hill. Nobody else is Tyreek Hill, but the combination of players that they've got, they're very close to replicating it. I'm very interested to see because Kadarius Tony basically came out and said, hey, I'm not actually injured at this point. Uh, wasn't happy where I was at. Like I said if, earlier, if you can't be happy going to Kansas City, playing with Mahomes and in this offense, you're probably never going to be happy in the National Football League. So I'm very excited about it. One thing I want to touch on very quickly with it is – Kansas City is a team that loves to use motion on the offensive side of the football. That is something that excites me for an electric player like Kadarius Toney. Looking at teams with the most touchdowns in motion this season, the Chiefs lead the way with 22. The next highest is 13. The Miami Dolphins, who have Tyreek Hill now at this point. It's the Dolphins, Ravens, Jets, Vikings. Uh, they're right behind them, but they have almost 10 more touchdowns using motion than any other team so far this year. Now they've got an electric weapon that will be used in motion, assuming he's healthy, which I kind of think that he is based on everything we've seen today. Um, yeah, I can't wait to watch this. Yeah, I think it's a really smart acquisition by the Kansas City Chiefs. Uh, love that analysis. And, and for the record, we have a showdown tonight. I, I spoke a little bit about showdown. I think at the end of the show, we're just going to touch on showdown for a second. And we're actually going to touch on why this line shifted like it did. And, and Mike McClure has a very good explanation for that, that I, I think will kind of 
see coming to fruition when this game starts. Of course, Mike and myself, Mike, you're on the early edge tonight, right? The the pre I, Thursday night football yep. preview. I will be on the early edge preview tonight. Yep. I will be on there as well. So everybody watching, check that out. We're going to have a lot of prop bets and there's a lot of things going on that aren't kind of out there yet that I think it's going to be really important as it pertains to the spread in this game, but also the, the player props and things of that nature. So catch a little bit of that at the end of this show, but definitely catch the 730 show. It's the early edge for those of you that don't know. And before we dive into this first game, Arizona plus three and a half at Minnesota, 48 and a half point total. This is obviously one of the one of the bigger games to stack. I, I do want to mention, hit the like button. Let's get over 100 likes so we can hear Mike's top three at each position. If you haven't already reviewed the podcast, we got a lot of really great reviews that have come in over the last few weeks. A lot of awesome tweets with lineups. Go ahead and hit the like button and go ahead and review the podcast. Let's get started, Mike. We got this 11-game slate. This is one of the dome games. So I, I do want to point out, I always look at the weather. It doesn't look like weather is going to factor in in really any of these games, at least not right now as we sit here on a Thursday. With that said, I do want to point out, as we get into the season, these Dome games typically take on a little bit more importance when it comes to the, the, the totals and things of that nature. And oh, by the way, the three highest totals on this main slate on Sunday happen to all three be Dome games. So I'm just kind of pointing that out. It's the Cardinals and the Vikings, which we're going to cover right now, the Dolphins and the Lions and the Raiders and the Saints. Those are the three highest totals on this slate, and they all happen to be in domes. Great conditions. So something to keep in mind when you are stacking these games this week and in the future. Arizona plus three and a half at Minnesota, 48 and a half point total, Mike. Um, both of these teams have weak secondaries. I think that's kind of where people are going to be looking to attack this game. It's got a nice total, 48 and a half, one of the higher ones. You know, D Hop, I think, is going to be somewhat popular. I think Justin Jefferson is going to be somebody that people are going to want to attack. Minnesota, obviously, coming off a bye here. Um, I don't know that there's a lot of other players in this game. I think Cousins' stacks are potentially in play. I think Kyler Murray's stacks are certainly in play, certainly to DeAndre Hopkins, who had a almost a 50% target share last week and caught 10 or 14 targets. Other than that, maybe Irv Smith as a salary saver. Is this a game you're keying in on? And if so, what side of the ball are you focused on? Yeah, it's a game that I'm keying in on a little bit. Uh, it'll be more of tournaments. Like I'm basically going to reserve one of my five lineups to have a, a lineup with Justin Jefferson and DeAndre Hopkins, likely Kyler Murray at quarterback in that lineup. And that's basically it from the game. I'm not going to try and get cute and pinpoint Herb Smith. I'm not going to get cute and try and play Dalvin Cook personally, anything like that. Uh, while I think Cook is an interesting play in this particular spot, I'm not going to get to that, but my main interest is in the two stud wide receivers. Uh, I do like Kyler Murray. I think we're going to see him start to rush a lot more. I think you're going to see an offense that's a ton of Kyler Murray picking up first downs with his legs and looking for as many opportunities to hit DeAndre Hopkins as we possibly can. And I think it's going to allow for them to be relatively competitive in these games, but I think they're going to turn in to shootouts a lot because I, you know, you're going to have situations where they go three and out because they throw two incomplete passes to DeAndre Hopkins, right? It's going to happen. It's going to create higher variance situations, which is going to lead basically more opportunities for them to be in a neutral or trailing game script, uh, which is really what you want a lot of the time when you're talking about these ceiling games in DFS. Um, the only other piece of advice I would have here, if you have access to legal sports betting or, or wherever you have it, and you can play a same game parlay, I will be playing same game parlays, uh, kind of laddered. Like when I say laddered, think of like a pitcher with strikeouts, right? I'll bet him at four and a half, but I'm also going to sprinkle on his five and a half, six and a half and seven and a half numbers and really try to get paid when I'm right. I'm going to do that with these two wide receivers. So I'm going to sprinkle on Hopkins and Justin Jefferson on their over receiving yards parlayed together. And then I'm going to take those numbers up to 100 each. And then I'm going to take them up to 125 each and pair them there. Just in case we get a shootout, uh, I think it's a really good way to make a lot of money, especially if they're too expensive for your DFS lineup and you're worried about them beating you in DFS. Simply bet they're over on yards. They might hit it by one or two yards. That's not going to be enough to kill you in DFS. But if they do, they've gone over. You're going to cash. Very likely scenario is you cash both ways, though, as those markets are efficient. You cash the over 76. They don't have 130 with two touchdowns. You, you won both ways. So that's what I'm looking at most in this game. Yeah, and I agree with you as far as Dalvin Cook is concerned. I, I'm not, you know, until I see some sort of uptick in, in the reception area, and they are coming off a bye. Maybe we'll see it this week. I think it'll be a reasonably contrarian play, although, Mike, you can maybe clarify that uh, because I'm, I'm not exactly sure what his ownership, where his ownership stands now. But, you know, this is one of the few times I mentioned this on the Tuesday show where, I kind of like Kyler Murray. You know, Mike, I've kind of been on his case all season. 
But this seems to be a pretty good setup for him, especially with his safety blanket back in DeAndre Hopkins. And I'll say from a safety blanket standpoint, I do think that DeAndre, DeAndre Hopkins just being targeted so much, I do think that takes a little bit, and we saw it last week, a little bit away from Ertz in terms of Ertz being that safety blanket. So we're not really seeing the floor that we'd like to see with Ertz. So I, I would be really careful. Mike, do you agree really careful in playing Ertz in this game? And follow-up to that is, Herb Smith, we know we can target tight ends against Arizona. Is that a you know is that a play you'd be interested in? Maybe as a secondary person in a Kirk Cousins stack. Yeah, the more I look at it, I actually do kind of like Herb Smith a little bit uh, in, in the spot. As far as Zach Ertz, I think that in a normal week I wouldn't be super interested. This week I don't hate it because there's a severe lack of expensive tight ends on the slate. Um, we don't know the status of Waller, at least I personally don't yet. Uh, George Kittle against the Rams, 5,700. Other than that, it's Ertz is the third most expensive tight end. He might be the second most expensive tight end on the slate. Uh, mm -hmm. I just think it's an inch. He's still got the upside, in my opinion, just because I do think he's still going to be a threat in the red zone. So he's not firmly in my player pool, but I haven't ruled him out of my player pool yet. I will say before we get, we're going to probably breeze through this Carolina Atlanta game before we get to Miami in Detroit. That's what's on deck for us. But I, I do a prop show, uh, Mike, you know, I do the prop show with uh, Jonathan Coachman, the coach, of course, and uh, prop stars and Dave Richard at four o'clock Eastern Standard Time uh, tomorrow on Friday. We do it every Friday. Uh, everybody knows Dave and, and prop stars are amazing. I try to keep up with those guys, but I will have a prop from this game and it will involve Kyler Murray. So I do, I might have multiple props, but I know I'm going to have one regarding Kyler Murray. And it actually plays to a lot of the stuff that Mike was just talking about. Tune in tomorrow or the early edge four o'clock for that Carolina and Atlanta, Carolina, a four and a half point dog at Atlanta. It's a 41 and a half point total, certainly a low total as we might expect. You know, I, I don't think I really want to get involved with this game outside of what appears to be a very suddenly chalky DJ Moore, who frankly is really like kind of the only guy to get targets or at least consistent targets. I mentioned how DeAndre Hopkins had almost a 50% target share uh, last week. He actually had 48%, which is just incredible. The, the second guy uh, in terms of target share had an incredible 47%, and that was DJ Moore. And I don't really see that tempering down. I, I don't think, I mean, they're going to be short area targets, the Curtis Samuel type targets, but without Christian McCaffrey, without Robbie Anderson, PJ Walker is going to be looking directly at DJ Moore. Are you playing the chalk here, Mike, or are you just overlooking this game entirely? Uh, probably going to play it in some situations, certainly not excluding from my player pool. Uh, I think the value is pretty obvious. It's so good at this point. Um, it, it might be necessary. It really depends on what you're doing at quarterback. And we're going to talk about that a lot later. Mm -hmm. Um, but, but there's one quarterback that's the stone minimum, $4,000. Uh, you kind of have to, in my opinion, have a little exposure to him. If you're doing that, I don't think you need to play DJ Moore. Uh, if you're playing anyone else at quarterback, the value is a little too obvious at that point that I, I think that you do want to have him in your player pool. Yeah, and for those of you that are not looking at a screen, looking at our screen on YouTube, by the way, if you haven't already hit the like button, hit it. But DJ Moore's only 5,300. He was only 4,900 last week, made him a, a pretty great value. He's still obviously a pretty great value. Would you say DJ Moore is a cash game lock, Mike? Yeah. Uh, yes, it's very close. He'll be, yeah, I'll say yes at this point in the week. Yeah. Okay. Um, let's move to the next game. By the way, I do want to point out, as it pertains to DJ Moore, Casey Hayward is out. Uh, defensive back, he's he's on IR. It looks like AJ Terrell is likely going to be out as well. That's just how I'm seeing things here on a Thursday. So should be more room for really all the receivers. I mean, I don't think anybody's taking a shot at Terrace Marshall this week, but I think that just is going to be even better for DJ Moore than it would already have been. Let's go to one of these games that, Mike, I know you like. Uh, I think everybody's going to like. It's the highest total of the week. It's Miami favored by three and a half points at Detroit. It's a 51 and a half point total. Miami's implied total is 27 and a half. Um, that's obviously huge. I think it's actually the highest total. It's the highest implied total on the slate. So I'll, I'll just set that table right now. Miami's 27 and a half. The next five teams, just from a implied total standpoint, it goes the Eagles, the Cowboys, the Vikings, the Raiders, and the Bengals. So Miami is set up for a great game against this terrible Detroit defense. Uh, l Mike, let me just kick it to you right off the bat here. Uh, is this your your favorite game to stack, and, and is Tua among your favorite quarterbacks? 
It is uh, favorite side. And look, I don't. I'm not going to have a bring back. It's going to be full on Miami onslaught. Personally, uh, much like it was last week for me with Cincinnati. Uh, I'm going to play two of the Tyreek. It's really straightforward. I'm going to play a ton of Tyreek. Tyreek, like last week, I had Jamar Chase in every single lineup. I'm going to have Tyreek Hill in every single lineup this week, uh, pretty much no matter what. I love, love, love this spot for him and for Tua in general. Um, look, I, I think we're going to see some man coverage. We're going to see some blitzing. I don't think they're going to get home very often, maybe two or three times in this game. But otherwise, we're going to see some big plays. Um, I, I love Tyreek here. I'm not at this moment planning to bring it back with anybody, though. Fair enough. And I, I do want to point out that Raheem Mostert uh, did pop up on the injury report today with, with a knee. So we're going to have to monitor that. And I say that because, Mike, I really like Raheem Mostert here as well. And, and I, you know, I, I'd like to get your opinion if, if you can play Tua with Tyreek Hill and Raheem Mostert because Raheem Mostert presents a lot of value, but he's certainly getting a lot of touches too. He is absolutely running this backfield and he's going against the Detroit defense likely in a neutral to positive game script all game that's allowing five and a half yards per carry, which is just to give some perspective, that's like bottom five in the league. So uh, uh, is Mostert in play in that stack, Mike? Yeah, Mostert's definitely in play. Um, I, I do that quite often where I have quarterback, number one wide receiver and running back who's got a ton of red zone opportunity and or upside catching passes. Um, that's what I see here in this spot. So we'll monitor his injury status. Uh, but I do think he is a great play and potentially a really good pivot away from one of the most chalky running backs on the slate. Who is, spoiler alert, go ahead. Tony Pollard. Oh, yeah, of course. We'll get to that. Um, let me ask you about Amon Ross St. Brown. Let's assume, I mean, I'd like to think his ankle is healthy, although I think he was limited in practice today, which I just think is interesting. Yep. He didn't actually register uh, like as a, as you know, get, having a concussion. So that, that's good news to me. That gave him an extra week to rest his ankle. But again, limited practice kind of makes me a little fearful. But are we in a scenario where we're getting Amon Ross St. Brown at potentially low ownership and maybe a slightly depressed price given what's happened with him over the last three or four weeks? I, I almost feel like, I mean, I think Tyreek Hill is going to get there anyway. But I think if you're doing yeah. Tyreek Hill and Mostert with Tua, you're really kind of hoping for some sort of back and forth. And I think even if DeAndre Swift is active, I don't want to play him. I feel like Amon Ross St. Brown would be the guy. Is he just too expensive? Is it too speculative at this point with him? Uh, it's a little too speculative. We'll see by the time Sunday rolls around. I think it's fine. Um, yeah, I, I think it's fine. But I, Tyreek is one of those guys that, I think he's going to have his five to seven catches for 40 yards through normal game, no matter what the game looks like, uh, and potentially hit the 40 yard touchdown pass that really gets him there. Uh, and I think that he's going to have that opportunity no matter what the game looks like, even if it's a 27 to nothing kind of game. Um, so I don't think it's absolutely necessary. The only time I would say it's absolutely necessary is the scenario where you want to stack Waddle, Tyreek, and uh you know, to a, something like that, then it's going to be necessary to have a bring back. But as of right now, I'm kind of on the fence about Amandra St. Brown. I'll wait it out. Uh, if all the reports are that he's actually good to go, ready to go, um, he'll be in my player pool. And one last thing, if you're not stacking this game, I'm assuming you're still okay playing Tyreek Hill, but I'm just curious with Jalen Waddle being $1,800 less, and that's justified, right? He's not getting the targets. He doesn't have the explosiveness. Nobody does. That's not an insult to Jalen Waddle. He doesn't have the explosiveness that Tyreek Hill has. Is Jalen Waddle maybe participating in some of these skinny stacks if you just can't afford Tyreek Hill, or you're just you're just going to pay up for Tyreek Hill if you're getting a piece of the Dolphins side? Personally, I'm paying up for Tyreek Hill if I'm getting the Dolphins side. Uh, I, I can tell you Tyreek's going to be in every lineup I build. Um, at least on DraftKings. I mm -hmm. haven't consulted FanDuel's pricing yet, but on DraftKings, it's going to be Tyreek in every lineup, just like Chase was for me last week. Um, but I will play a little bit of Waddle. Um, a, a little bit of Waddle. Okay. So we talked about Amon Ra and, and a little bit of, you know, DeAndre Swift and the Detroit offense potentially pushing back a little bit against the Detroit Lions. And, in for, and excuse me, against the Dolphins, who, by the way, their secondary continues to get injured. So, like, somebody is going to be successful for Detroit uh, at the receiver end. It's just a matter of how successful, how much is that sort of uh, portfolio diversified among the receivers and the, the pass catchers. I include DeAndre Swift and Jamal Williams in that uh, and Hawkinson, of course, as well. With all of that said, let's transition to the next game because I'm not sure we have a back and forth in this Philadelphia Eagles uh, at home against the Pittsburgh Steelers game. 
Pittsburgh's a 10 and a half point dog. It's only a 43 and a half point total. Now, the flip side of that, of course, is we have one of the highest, I think it's the second highest implied total on the slate with the Philadelphia Eagles at 27. So how are you playing this game? A.J. Brown or bust for me. Um, I like A.J. Brown isolated in tournaments. Uh, he, he's got one of the best matchups, in my opinion, that, that he's seen all season uh, individually. It's not the best matchup on paper. Obviously, we've seen this Pittsburgh defense be good uh, in certain situations. But this, to me, projects as a game where A.J. Brown's going to break out, going to have that potential spike game uh, where he just has all the work, one or two big, big plays in this one. Uh, the issue, well, I guess it's not an issue. It's a great thing. He, he's No one's going to own him. A.J. Brown is going to be very, very low owned in this spot, and it makes a lot of sense. He's more expensive than DeAndre Hopkins is in this game, right? So mm -hmm. I like him. Uh, I'm projecting him around 2% owned. Uh, I think wow. that number could balloon as high as 4 or 5 but 0% chance he's double-digit ownership. So if you like A.J. Brown like I do, this is, in my opinion, a week to isolate him. And I won't recommend playing him uh, instead of DeAndre Hopkins. What I would recommend doing is building a lineup with Sam Ellinger at quarterback, who we're going to talk about here in a little bit. And mm -hmm. then your three receivers can be Tyreek Hill, AJ Brown, and DeAndre Hopkins. And all of a sudden you've got a ton of upside, but you're going to be incredibly different because anyone else who's playing AJ Brown is most likely doing it in place of one of those two. Um, I, I like this spot where I pair him with two other elite wide receivers where AJ's average game and one ceiling game from one of the other two can still give me a very, very healthy score at all three wide receiver positions. And obviously at the top of this list here of players in this game, which again, if you're watching on YouTube, you can see uh, DraftKings is pulled up. We see Jalen Hurts at the top at 8,300 going against a very, very substandard uh, pass defense, partly because of injuries, admittedly. Is Jalen Hurts in, in your play? I know you only build a certain amount of lineup, so I'm just, you know, Jalen Hurts is going to be popular. He's the most expensive quarterback on the slate. I think the average player, and that's not meant to be an insult, is going to see Jalen Hurts, and then they're going to see, like, Tua and Cousins, and they're not going to be super impressed with those names. I'm Again, I'm talking about the average player, and they're just going to go up to Jalen Hurts. They might stack him. They might play him naked. Is he in your pool? He is not in my player pool as of right now, no. And the reason for that is Sam Ellinger. We're going to talk about him. I'm mentioning it a lot because he's four thousand dollars. Usually in this kind of situation, the quarterback is five to fifty five hundred. Uh, being four thousand, it, it's like having an obvious value tight end play. Uh, it just allows you to do so much. So that's the reason why my quarterback pool is a lot more narrow this week. I, I think there will only be three total across all 10 of my lineups, the five on DraftKings, five on FanDuel. I think I'm only using three total quarterbacks. Okay. Love to hear it. Okay. And as far as I'm concerned, I mean, I, I will probably play a little bit of Jalen Hurts, um, maybe naked, uh, maybe with AJ Brown. But uh, to your point, Mike, um, this isn't, this certainly isn't one of my favorite stacks, uh, especially in, in a game that could be a little non-competitive potentially with the Eagles coming off a bye in the, in the second half, we could see a little bit of Miles Sanders in, in some of that running game as well. Uh, but uh, fair enough. If you were just for, for those who are stacking this game, is this just a game where you just avoid the run back altogether? Or do you play Absolutely. like a guy like George Pickens or, or, or Chase Claypool? I mean, I think you can, if you want to, um, for me personally, it would be just all one sided, no bring back. Yeah. All right. Okay, I do think Deontay Johnson could be kind of sneaky there because I don't think anybody's going to play him at 5,600. If they're doing a run back in that game, it's going to be Pickens yeah. or Claypool. But I actually think Deontay probably has the better matchup there. I think Pickens is certainly – I think he's more likely to see uh, Darius Slay, but uh, you know, we'll see how that bears out. Okay, it's interesting to see, by the way, Najee Harris at 5,700. We're going to get to this Las Vegas minus 1.5 at New Orleans game, 49.5 point total. But before we do that, we're going to hear a word from our partners. And we are back. This is Fantasy Football Today, DFS. If you haven't already joined our contest, it is in this YouTube link that you're watching. It's it's right there. Or if you're listening on Apple Podcasts, it's just embedded in the, the podcast. You just click on it, and you click on the link, and you're in our 200-entry DraftKings contest. While you're there, scroll to the bottom and hit five stars and make some comments if you wish about how much you like uh, this podcast. That would be appreciated, but definitely hit that like button. We want to get to 100 likes to hear Mike's top three at each position. 
Speaking of top three, this is a top three game to stack, Mike. The Las Vegas Raiders minus one and a half. It's still weird for me to say Las Vegas Raiders for some reason. <laughs> the Oakland Las Vegas Raiders minus one and a half at the New Orleans Saints. It, Saints. It's a 49 and a half point total. There is some injury news that we're still not sure about in this game. I'm, we're not entirely sure about Michael Thomas or Jarvis Landry, Darren Waller. Adam Troutman, who becomes relevant because the Juwan John, what we saw from Juwan Johnson last week. With all of that said, I don't know, Mike. Maybe you have a read on, on which of these receivers is going to play. I, I doubt you do, but if you do, please let us know. Uh, this certainly seems like a great game to stack. The Saints are scoring a bunch of points. They're also allowing a bunch of points. I suspect it's going to be Andy Dalton at quarterback. Regardless, I love Chris Olave. I do like Alvin Kamara a lot, and I'm hopeful that if I'm playing Alvin Kamara, you know, Taysom Hill isn't vulturing all the touchdowns maybe Kamara can finally get in the end zone but he's getting a lot of targets and that's really good especially when Andy Dalton is in the game could you play both of those guys with maybe uh maybe a cheap or zero Las Vegas run back here yeah you could definitely do it without a run back um I have a slight not slight I have a strong preference for Alvin Kamara um Olave is totally fine I think he's incredible player uh probably going to be both used both very viable I love Alvin Kamara, though, uh, in this spot. He's my – I have him listed as my second favorite. I'm going to bump him to my first favorite running back of the week. Mm. Uh, mm. I'm. You mentioned the passing game. I love the work that he's getting in the passing game. Dalton's going to be starting at quarterback. There's a report that came out that said Dalton is the starter the rest of the way, no matter what the status of Jameis is. Mm -hmm. uh, so I, I do like uh, that a lot for Alvin Kamara. Um the usage is good, both in the run and passing game. You look at his game log, and you, you see these scores, right? Pretty good scores considering he hasn't found the end zone all season. Uh, mm -hmm. Once he has the game where he scores two touchdowns, we're talking 35 to 40 fantasy points uh, pretty, pretty quickly here. This projects as a matchup where he has all of the upside in the world. The price point is super friendly. This is a guy that used to be $9,000 in previous years in somewhat similar situations. So I love Alvin Kamara here. He's my favorite running back on the slate. And then on the other side, I have to mention Devontae Adams because Devontae Adams has an incredible matchup here. Uh, I think they're going to continue to force the football his way. I, I think that this is also a potential spike game for him where we're talking about 60 fantasy points between Kamara and Devontae Adams. No interest in either of the quarterbacks, so there'll be skinny stacks uh, or individual plays. But this is one of my favorite spots of the week. Um, you know, There are a lot of wide receivers I like. I love Tyreek Hill. A.J. Brown's a great tournament play. Devontae Adams right there with DeAndre Hopkins. Um, th this is a really good individual matchup for Devontae. Yeah, and I, I thought I had seen something about him, and as this show goes, maybe popping up on the injury report. If it was, it was – or maybe he just missed practice today with an illness. I, I don't think it's anything serious. But, again, you always want to monitor injuries just in case. Uh, let me ask you about Josh Jacobs because guys like – and I'll, I'll ask you kind of about two guys, and we'll cover one of them in a second, but – Josh Jacobs at 7,500 and guys like Ken Walker, who I believe is 6,500. These are guys that have been really chalky, particularly last week. I mean, Ken Walker, the last couple of games and Jacobs as well. Is, is it just, are we at a point where on this slate with wanting to stack the receivers like you want to stack that you're just not going to get there with Josh Jacobs at 7,500 or do you, do you play a lineup with Josh Jacobs and, you know, maybe Olave on the way back, or maybe even you correlate him with the, the pass catching running back in Alvin Kamara? Yeah, look, I think that Jacobs has to be in your player pool. Um, I'm not going to have a lot of them. I might have one lineup with him, uh, but I, I really want to jump on Devontae Adams the same way that I want to jump on Alvin Kamara here. Uh Devontae Adams and Alvin Kamara have simply run bad in terms of touchdown scoring at this point, while Jacobs mm -hmm. has run incredibly good the last three weeks what does he have six touchdowns in the last three weeks um while that that's awesome and it's obviously a running back you get touches near the goal line that can happen quite often six is not the number we would project there the number is probably three one touchdown per game right uh so these box scores were he hasn't scored less than 33.3 DraftKings points in three weeks that has a massive impact on the overall ownership here uh, i i still think we're going to have games where it's the Devonte adams show um, so I'm more likely to play Adams than I am Jacobs because I, I love Alvin Kamara and I think there are some other running backs in a little bit better spots. Um, that said, I'm not excluding him totally. He'll he'll be in probably one of my five. 
Okay, and for the record, if you weren't already convinced about Alvin Kamara, the Raiders' defense is not good, specifically against pass-catching running backs. So even if the rushing isn't super efficient for Alvin Kamara, if he's getting the targets in the passing game, uh, not only is he going to be successful with them, but I do think he falls in the end zone in this game. Again, this is a basically a 50-point total. And even if Taysom gets some run, which he really didn't, he hasn't, uh, you know, in the last couple of weeks, uh, I think it's Alvin Kamara's turn to get in the end zone, if not once, maybe twice. I mean, we, we've seen it with Alvin, right? Like, we've seen a six-touchdown game from Alvin Kamara. It wasn't that long ago. So um, that was in one game. Regression is coming uh, for Alvin Kamara in a positive way. Let's race through a couple games before we get to the 4 o'clock games. And they're good. when I say race, it's only because I don't think there's a lot in these games that we're going to pull from other than, Mike, what you said was going to be the most popular running back on the slate, and it's for good reason. So we have the Chicago Bears plus nine and a half big dogs at the Dallas Cowboys. It's a 42 and a half point total. Listen, it doesn't look like Zeke's going to play. Okay. So Tony Pollard is 6,100. We finally get to, so here's part of the reason he's popular, right? I mean, it's, it's certainly a good matchup for, for Dallas just in general, but everybody has been waiting to unleash, whether it's in your redraft leagues or your dynasty leagues or in DFS or in the prop market, everybody's just been waiting to unleash on Tony Pollard. And we finally get the opportunity to do that. So not only is he popular for kind of like good reason on this particular slate, good value, people just want to play this guy. And I'm curious where you're at. Is he a, is he a cash game lock and B is he in your GPP lineups as well? Uh, yeah, he's in the most of the lineups so far. Uh, again, making the assumption that it, it's his backfield entirely here this week, which, look, it, it's very possible the Cowboys do something different. Um, wouldn't shock me at all, but I, I think this is the day where he has not only 100 yards because he has 17 carries, but he also lands in the end zone, catches a few passes, has that big game, right? So I, I like him a lot. He's in my player pool. Um, you know, look, it's... $6,100 for the running back in that offense and, and what is a pretty good matchup again in a home game. Um, yeah, there's a lot to like about Tony Pollard, assuming that it is truly his backfield. Yeah. And if you just look at, I mean, it's so funny because you watch these Cowboys games and you see Zeke. And again, I get it. We talk about it every show. I mean, I know I do where I'm like, I know Zeke's good at pass protection. I know like that he does things that not only Tony Pollard can't do, but a lot of the running backs can't do in some in terms of some of those things you don't see in the stat sheet. But you look at the yards per carry, and every single game it feels like Tony Pollard's yards per carry is it's not just better, it's double Zeke Elliott's yards per carry. So you're just kind of waiting for him to kind of get out there. So, you know, I I think there's always that argument. I mean, not you know, it's it's more in you know, when we do PGA DFS and we see chalk, it's like, okay, it's very easy to fade the chalk in PGA DFS. But in NFL DFS, you all you sometimes get that discussion about like the, the free square. Does this qualify or 6,100? I mean, it's not it's not your, your classic free square where it's like, you know, a couple of years ago, Gus Edwards or something at 4,000 or something. But is this the kind of thing you shouldn't be bashful playing in tournaments because of it, it being his backfield if it ends up being that that that's the case? In this particular matchup, yes, I think it is. Uh, it reminds me a little bit of a scenario last year where we had Alexander Madison. He was $5,500, yeah. uh, just one of those spots. I think Madison still had more upside individually just because of the way the team played at that point. Um, but it's somewhat similar. He's definitely in your player pool. Okay. Uh, anybody on the Bears side? I mean, I, I think the answer is no, but I, I feel like I have to ask the question. And, and is CeeDee Lamb at 7K? I mean – it just doesn't seem like the week to play CD lamb in a 42 and a half point total with a, with a big spread, especially with Dak kind of looking just kind of average last week, anybody on the Cowboys side or the Bears side, not named Tony Pollard that you might be interested in. Not at this point. No. Okay. Let's move on then to another game that we're going to go through pretty quickly because it's the new England Patriots at the New York jets. It's a 40 half, 40 and a half point total. The new England Patriots are again at New York and they're favored by two and a half. Nope. No Brees hall here. And I think the question here from a Brees Hall, New York Jets standpoint is the extent to which James Robinson is going to play or be active or be integrated into this offense. I guess my question for you, and maybe I don't think we know exactly what J-Rob's role is going to be. If we learn that he's just not going to be active or he's not going to have a big role, does Michael Carter at 5,900 become part of the conversation? Because he's also a pass catching running back. Is that somebody you would speculate on? Clearly, the receivers are probably not going to be in play for you on either side, is my guess, at a 40 and a half point total. 
I'm guessing Ramondre Stevenson really isn't quite in the conversation for you, even though he's been great. I do see Damian Harris getting a, a few more carries relative to last week against the Chicago Bears. Uh, is it is it Michael Carter or nothing, or is it just flat out nothing? Uh, it's flat out nothing at this point. Uh, look, Stevenson is the closest thing to a play for me here. Um, and mm-hmm. the reason is, yes, I think Harris gets some more. Stevenson is incredibly good. I've been encouraged with the passing game work, though. He had eight receptions on eight targets last game, five targets the game before. We've seen multiple other games with five. Uh, once a running back like that with his upside, especially in the red zone, um, once that number is multiple weeks at five or above, uh, it starts to signal some pretty significant upside that could lead to spike games. Um, so for that reason, I think you have to at least consider him and yeah, he's my favorite play in the game if I had to play someone. And I'm going to ask you about, um, this, this is going to be kind of probably a prelude to maybe your top threes, by the way, hit the like button. If you haven't already, we'd like to get over a hundred Mike in terms of the new England defense, is is that a defense that, that people are playing uh, in and do you have maybe in terms of like maybe the mo- more popular defenses, is there maybe one or two that are just screaming out or is it just kind of flat across the defenses? Uh, I'm going to pull up the ownership on that, but I will tell you that I personally am going to play the Patriots defense. Uh, okay. I, I like the spot. I personally think the Jets aren't one aren't very good. That's just yeah. my, my opinion of everything that I've watched, everything that I've seen. Right. Uh, and I think that they could really struggle without Brees Hall. I, I think that his loss might really start to show itself uh, over the next few games here. So the Patriots are projecting as a top four or five defense in terms of ownership overall, um, but nothing crazy to the point where we've seen a couple times this year where there's a defense at 20 to 30% owned. Uh, mm-hmm. I don't think that they get up that high. Yeah, Zach Wilson without Brees Hall could be quite the experience. So uh, yeah. I, I think uh, he hasn't really been exposed yet because of Brees Hall, at least not since he's come back from the injury. And this could be a situation where it could get ugly for the New York Jets, or at least ugly enough where they're reduced to the old New York Jets instead of the New York, New York Jets. Okay, let's go to the four o'clock games. We've got four of them this week, just like last week. Tennessee at Houston. Uh, I think this one is a little interesting from a value standpoint because it doesn't look like Nico Collins is going to play. Again, I think we have to wait for official word on him. And if he doesn't, I think guys like Philip Dorsett might be popular, might be good values. I think, I don't know, Chris Moore might get into the conversation to some degree, at least in terms of uh, targets that are being replaced by Nico Collins. I'm not super enamored by that, but Ryan Tannehill, like we're not sure he's going to play. It looked like Malik Willis on Thursday took, if not all the reps, most of the reps. At least that's the video footage that I saw uh, from the Tennessee Titans practice today. We know Tannehill left the game in a walking boot. But he's shed that walking boot. His ankle is heavily taped. I'm not sure he's going to play. And I just wonder, Mike, if he doesn't play, is Malik Willis, and I know we're going to talk about Ellinger in a second, but Ellinger in a second, but is Malik Willis potentially a play because he can pick up those rushing yards? And if not, do we downgrade Derrick Henry just a little bit because of the lack of a threat of the of the passing game from Malik Willis? I mean, they don't pass a lot anyway, but I think Tannehill's probably the more reliable guy at this point in terms of the dropbacks. Does Malik Willis starting affect Derrick Henry? Um, I think it could have a minor impact. I don't, I don't think it's massive. Um, Henry's not someone you were playing anyway in terms of like cash games most likely. So I don't think it's going to have a massive, massive impact. You're playing Derrick Henry because of the upside he presents, not because you're projecting 24 versus 22 touches kind of thing. You're just simply just playing him because of the upside that he presents, him, at least in my opinion. Um so I don't think it has a massive impact on Derrick Henry. Anything yeah, that it does is negated by the ownership drop because of that thought process. Yeah, and Zach, keep it here on this Derrick Henry game log because I'm interested, you know, you talked about the three receivers that you really want to jam in. And and, and I'm forgetting, I think it was Jefferson, DeAndre Hopkins, and maybe A.J. Brown. And that was specifically to the Sam Ellinger lineup. So um, yeah. I get that, that that was a very specific scenario. But I'm curious, of those three receivers, does Derrick Henry, and because they're all expensive, right? Does Derrick Henry eclipse any of these guys? And, and I say that, you know, looking at this game log, 128 yards rushing last week, 102, 114. And oh, by the way, in the passing game, he's picking up yardage as well. And he's picking up targets, not a ton, but three targets, two targets, five targets, six targets over his last four contests. 
does Derek is is he in your player pool? It looks like he's obviously in a in amazing matchup against the Houston Texans defense. You can't stop the run. They're allowing five point two four yards per carry, which is bad. Is he eclipsing any of those receivers that you really like? I yeah, I mean, look, there are scenarios where he eclipses them for sure. Um, I, I think that Justin Jefferson probably has the widest range of outcomes uh, in this particular spot, just because the Vikings could find success in other ways. Uh, and we've, we've seen it right. And his price points, the highest at 9,100. Um, so if I had to leave one out, it would probably be Justin Jefferson and just focus on the Deandre Hopkins, um, where he has really no threat for targets, um, no threat of a running game, things like that. So, and, and likely a guaranteed neutral or negative game script. Um, so yeah, I'll say that, uh, he, he definitely can eclipse all three of them though. Uh, I, I think that that's definitely possible. And, in, and I'll confirm this before the show is out. It does look like Nico Collins is going to be out. Any interest in Chris Moore at 3,400 or Philip Dorsett at 3,200? And is Damian Pierce a fade or a play here against a pretty staunch uh, Tennessee Titans rushing defense? Uh, Pierce is going to be a fade for me personally. Uh, I get why people want to play him. It's impossible to argue with the volume. He's essentially Derrick Henry in terms of volume uh, with, with a price point that is $2,000 cheaper. So, um I'm not going to play him, though. It's a pretty difficult matchup uh, in this division game. So I'm out on Pierce. Uh, as far as the cheaper guys, I don't hate it, uh, but I, I really don't love it. I think you could do better, and I, I would rather take a value route at the quarterback position with Ellinger um, and spend a little more elsewhere personally. Yeah, gotcha. And I, I did check on Nico Collins' status. So he didn't practice on Thursday with the growing injury. All signs sort of point to him not playing on Sunday, but him not practicing Thursday does not mean he's definitely not playing. So something to monitor if you're interested in the backup receivers in this game. Speaking of backup receivers, Mike, professional transition. We got the Giants at the Seattle Seahawks, and I don't think DK Metcalf is going to play. I know he shouldn't play, and so I don't think he's going to play. And I frankly don't think he's going to play next week either. With that said, we we have some value that potentially opens up because, and maybe not just at the receiver position, but maybe at the tight end position as well um, for the Seattle Seahawks. Now, this is a 44 and a half point total. Seattle's favored by three. Giants are are riding high. You wonder when that sort of that trip is going to come to an end for them. Is it this week? I mean, I, I actually like your thoughts on that. I know you do the early edge preview. I believe it's on Tuesdays. Correct me if I'm wrong. It's on Tuesdays or Mondays where you go over every single game with RJ White, with Jonathan Coachman and, and others and break down every single game. I'm curious what your thoughts were just from a point spread standpoint with this game. Kenneth Walker, 6,500. Saquon Barkley, 8,100. Hard to argue with either of those. I guess my question though is, are you getting there with either of them? And is a Geno Lockett stack in play? If not, Lockett, Goodwin, are they in your player pool? Yeah, so I'll start with Kenneth Walker. I love him. Uh, I think he's great play in this spot. I think he's also going to feed off of the energy of getting to play opposite of Saquon Barkley. Uh, it, it's a very real thing for especially young, impressive running backs like this. Uh, love the price point here, 6,500. He's going to be popular again, but for good reason. Um, really, really like him there. Uh, as far as games, uh, the game itself, uh, I lean Seattle here, which is a little wild. They're minus three. Uh, the Giants, again, the Giants are the better coach team. They've largely overperformed so far this season. Um, Saquon's in, in a decent spot overall, but it is a tough road environment here for the Giants. So as of right now, it's Kenneth Walker for me. I could get to Tyler Lockett a little bit. Uh, he, he's going to be in the player pool for sure. Goodwin could be in the player pool as well. Um, so that means Geno is there. I just don't think that it's the obvious Geno week or obvious Geno in the player pool like it has been, uh, you know, over the last few. Um, so I'm not ruling them out, but not core lineup pieces this week like they were in the past. The one player that becomes a pretty important piece for me against this Giants defense is going to be Noah Fant. Uh, I like Noah Fant, assuming DK Metcalf is out. I think things change just a little bit in the passing game here. Uh, and I think this could be a potential week for Noah Fant to find the end zone, have a big enough game to pay off the very modest $2,800 price tag. Now is, correct me if I'm wrong, is Will Disley, he is playing in this game, right? Uh, let me check on everything here. He should be though. Yes. But you, and so I only ask and, and I think he is too. I only ask because you're not afraid of like the, the Will Disley kind of pulling some targets away from Noah Fan. Uh, not necessarily. We've seen them both playing in, in recent weeks, but we've seen, uh, you know, 
against Arizona, Noah Payne had seven targets. He had five targets against New Orleans. Um, he, he's definitely going to be out there. I think we see a change in philosophy a little bit in terms of the number of tight ends in some of the sets. Uh, I ultimately think that Fant is athletic enough that, again, they kind of use him in, in a hybrid role, if you will, in this particular matchup. So I like Noah Fant here. I could be incredibly wrong. The good news is, is the opportunity cost at tight end, not the same that it normally is. So there, there is no Mark Andrews. There is no Travis Kelsey. Um, we don't have any real tight end that's basically a wide receiver on this slate. Um, so I'm more willing to take risks at this point, knowing that I'm very unlikely to be trying, having to fade a 30 point performance at tight end this week. And real quick, before we move on, when you say for the, for the newer sort of DFS players, when you say opportunity cost, tell, tell us what you mean. Yeah, just the opportunity in that particular spot, uh, you know, using a tight end that I know has a floor of probably two to three points and maybe a ceiling of only 15 to 20 the average tight end on the slate is essentially that as well. Where in a normal week when we have Travis Kelsey, we have Mark Andrews, we have some of these other guys, we have Hawkinson in a great matchup, things like that. Uh, there's a very strong probability that the tight end number one on the slate is scoring close to 30 fantasy points. We don't have that this week. So my Noah Fant play at 2,800, while it saves me salary and lets me to spend elsewhere, if he has a game of 7.9 points, like we've seen him have three or four of the last five weeks, basically, uh, it's not going to kill me. Absolutely. And in, for the record, I, I like Ken Walker as well. Uh, I've definitely come around to him this weekend. I like Lockett and Goodwin. I mean, I, Goodwin is speculative. Uh, you know, the floor perhaps is low, but uh, I like the upside there. I mean, the Giants will come after Geno Smith and they'll play some man. And, it, you know, Geno doesn't do it with a lot of pass attempts, but when he's efficient, he's really efficient. And now the the... the Targets are perhaps maybe just as concentrated, but with DK Metcalf out, it's really Tyler Lockett and a bunch of discount guys. So I think this is a really interesting game, maybe to get a couple pieces up on the Seattle side, maybe to stack it. It's certainly a dangerous stack, not one of the, you know, the more popular ones for sure. Real quick before we get to this um, Sam Ellinger game, Wandale Robinson's only 4,700. Is that the type of value you might want to play, regardless of whether you're stacking or not? Um, I think it's okay. Um, I, I, not someone that I had in my player pool initially. Um, it's okay. All right. I prefer Fair if enough. he was like 41, 4,200 personally. Yeah. Okay. So let's move to at 425. We got the Washington football team. That's what I'm going to call them uh, at the Indianapolis Colts. It's a 39 and a half point total. That's very low. Uh, the Indianapolis Colts implied total, just to give you some perspective on that. 21.25 Washington's is 18.25. Sam Ellinger's only $4,000 and he's the starting quarterback in this game. Got Jonathan Taylor. He's, you know, relatively priced up, not really at 8k. Uh, Michael Pittman, 7,200. Paris Campbell, Alec Pierce in that standard sort of mid 4K range. Sounds like you like Sam Ellinger, Mike. I do. Um, you know, if you followed me for a while, you know, I like to find a cheap quarterback in a lot of situations, jam some studs in. Uh, I like him in this spot quite a bit. Um, go ahead. Go ahead. You no, know, I was going to say so. Let me break it down real quick. So, do you like him in cash and in tournaments? And, and if you like him in cash, is he a guy that's going to be a staple in your cash games? And is he going to be unaffiliated with any of the receivers? Mostly unaffiliated with receivers. I like him in all formats just because of the price point and because of what's, what it allows me to do. Uh, it's not because I love him individually. It is the combination of can I play Sam Ellinger at 4K and get Tyreek Hill and say DeAndre Hopkins in there for almost the same price as playing someone like Kirk Cousins, Irv Smith, and Justin Jefferson. And I think that I think that it's a much better combination, right? So that that's why I'm going to play him. Um, what I want to focus on most, though, with him is the rushing upside. I think he has enough rushing upside to be dangerous. Uh, if you watched him play at Texas, I know quarterbacks tend to run more in college football. Uh, he was very, he, I shouldn't say very, he was dynamic enough and electric enough with the legs uh, let's look at the preseason so far this year. I know it's a preseason game. Last game you played one rushing attempt, 45 yard touchdown. Hmm. First game you played four rushing attempts, 24 yards. Uh, he played in the preseason last year, right? Eight rushing attempts, 30 yards in the first preseason game. 
I'm not saying he's Taysom Hill. He's nowhere close to being Taysom Hill. But if he can have even 30 rushing yards in this game out of necessity, whatever it may be, that goes a long way to a quarterback's floor when they're $4,000 on the slate. So I, I also think that there are situations where we could see naked, or we could see bootleg plays where there's a fake to Jonathan Taylor because everyone in the building knows Jonathan Taylor's getting the football, right? Mm-hmm. He's more than capable of doing things like that. And I personally think he has just as much upside throwing the football as Matt Ryan at this point in Matt Ryan's career. Um, so I like him. I'm playing him. This could be a week that I don't cash, and that's fine for me. But the more likely scenario is, is I throw him out there. He gets close to 20 fantasy points. Anything above that is absolute money, and it allows me to have three wide receivers that potentially score 30 points each. Yeah, and I do think you know one thing Washington does well. They're pretty good against the run. They're awful in the secondary, but they can also rush the passer. So I mean, I do think that lends itself to Sam Ellinger, Ellinger kind of using his legs to break the pocket and, and to get a first down sort of the, the old school way with his legs. So uh, I think there's going to be opportunities uh, for him in, in this game. If you wanted to get crazy and you really wanted to save money, Sam Ellinger with Paris Campbell at 4,500, does that make sense? Just knowing that, that again, it's extremely speculative. Obviously Pittman's, you know, Pittman is in this game, Alec Pierce, they've got all the, all three of the tight ends, but Campbell has been the target hog over the last couple of weeks. Is it, I, I understand you're, you're taking a shot in more ways than one with, with Ellinger to Paris Campbell. But if you wanted to get crazy and really save money, is that in play at all? Or you, we're just gonna, kind of going too far afield here? Oh, no, it's definitely in play. And I'll tell you the other thing that's in play. When we get to the cheat sheet, you're going to see a name, Jonathan Taylor, on mine. Uh, what's in play here is a, a lot of checking down and dumping off to Jonathan Taylor, who, mm. by the way, is more than capable of catching passes out of the backfield, uh, as evident by last week. Um so, yeah, I it's very speculative, right? We could see a game where Sam Ellinger doesn't run the football at all. I, I think that that's very possible as well. So understand that when we're talking about it, but I'm going to take that bet. Uh, quickly looking back at when he played at Texas in the four years, 114 rushing attempts as a freshman, 164 as a sophomore, 163 as a junior, 113 uh, as a senior there, his junior year, he had 130 or 163 rushing attempts in 13 games, 663 rushing yards in those 13 games. Uh, again, I know it doesn't translate super well to the NFL, but when you're capable of doing that in those situations in a league like that, I personally think he's got a little bit of upside. I think Frank Wright knows that. And I think that's why he's going to use him in the spot. Cause like someone Dave said in the chat, it's not like their season is done in that particular division being three and three. Three, three, and one. Right. Totally agree. I'll, I'll, for the record, on the Washington side, I'm not really interested in any, but I, McLaurin had a nice spike game last week. It could happen again. I don't think I'm willing to pay up for any Washington member. Mike, uh, same answer for you or no? Yeah, same answer for me. Uh, I'm going to isolate the the value on uh, Sam Elger and move on, basically. Okay, speaking of moving on, let's hit one more game before we go to our top three in our cheat sheet. It's the San Francisco 49ers minus one and a half at the Los Angeles Rams a 42 and a half point total. I don't have a ton of interest in this game. Oh, by the way, I just saw, I just looked at how many people were watching. I think we had close to 200 just a a couple moments ago, but we only have, as far as I can tell, 52 likes. So let's get those up. I mean, listen, if if half of you that haven't hit the like button, hit the like button right now, we're going to get to a hundred really easy. And we're going to give the top three from Mike McClure at each position. I mean, it's, I, I, it's really easy to find the like button. Like, so go ahead and hit it real quick. We're going to cover San Francisco, Los Angeles Rams. And if we don't have the hundred likes, I might just go right to the cheat sheet. I mean, it's, I, I see all you, all of you watching. Like it's really, I promise you, it is not hard to hit the like button. Uh, if, if you don't see it, pull the chat down and then you'll see it right away. San Francisco minus one and a half at the Rams. I just covered that 42 and a half point total. I, I, I don't, I don't really like anything here. I mean, I think Cooper cup is great. Last time he played this team, he caught 14 of 19 targets. We know they're, Kind of like kind of just pitching everything underneath because they don't have a field stretcher. With that said, Van Jefferson is back. I still think it's going to be the Cooper Cup show. I'm not interested in the Rams backfield. I'm not 100% sure Henderson's going to get the lion's share of the carries. And if he does, I'm not really sure he's going to do anything great with it. Uh, you know, do I want to pay up for Cup in this particular game with a, a pretty low total and a pretty good defense? Probably not. I, I think it's interesting. I think you could play Cup and maybe like, a, you know, a speculative or slightly contrarian uh, Kittle run back because Kittle's starting to get the targets. And if Debo Samuel is out, I think it's certainly a bump up to Ayuk and George Kittle. 
that's how I see this game. To me, it's kind of like Kittle or or maybe nothing in this game. How do you see it? Yeah, you might have talked me into Kittle, uh, 5,700. If Debo is out, uh, you know, I might change my stance a little bit on the tight end position. Um, other than that, I've spent the last hour talking about the wide receivers that I love. I, I kind of love Christian McCaffrey in yeah. this spot. I don't know what the playbook's going to look like for him, other than the fact that they know he's capable of catching passes. If Debo's not out there, I think he gets used even more. Um, he's playing the Rams again, a team that he just played. They couldn't stop him at all on an awful Carolina offense. Uh, I, and it wasn't just sheer volume that got him there. He only touched the football 13 times on the ground against them. 69 yards, no touchdown, had eight targets, seven receptions in the passing game. That's where I think that he's going to be used and needed for Jimmy. So there are scenarios out there where I have a Christian McCaffrey lineup uh, and end up playing one of those value receivers. Um, yeah. Okay. Uh, yeah, I don't mind the Christian McCaffrey play. I, I just don't know if I'm going to get up up to that. But yeah, it's it's definitely it's always a Christian McCaffrey spot, just like it's always a Cooper Cup spot. It's just a matter of whether you can incorporate him into your life. I see something in the chat, by the way. Um, I see the lights going up too, but we're still not there. Um, Derek Graham says Colts DST. I I, I want to point that out to you because I think the Washington DST is interesting too. Like, listen, I, I understand the Sam Ellinger play, of, of course. And it, but it, we, we have to admit it could be boom or bust, right? So, I mean, it, it is, oh, yeah. is Washington a defense to potentially play? Obviously, you're not going to be playing Colts or, or Sam Ellinger in, in that type of scenario. But is that a defense you'd consider in perhaps your non-Sam Ellinger stack or, your, or, or plays? Or are you so convinced that he's going to do at least okay, you're just going to avoid Washington? So that's a great question. Uh, Commander's defense, Washington football team, I like that name better anyway. Uh, they are projecting as the number one owned defense on the slate. Makes a ton of sense. They're, they're facing mm -hmm. a quarterback making the start there, right? So I'm not going to go that route because I, whether I'm right or wrong, I've convinced myself that Sam Ellinger is the guy that I need to be playing this week. So I I tell you what I do every week and then I go do it, right? That's, that's exactly what we do here. Uh, I'm going to play Sam Ellinger this week, no matter what. And I don't care what anyone else says about it. It's what I believe. So I'm going to take that stance. Uh it's a beautiful situation for me because it's either going to be a really good week or probably a not so good week. And I might minimum cash because we know that the commanders are going to be the most popular defense. If the most popular defense is going up against my most popular quarterback, yeah. that's a good spot to be in. I like that leverage. Let's apply it. Right. So mm -hmm. I like the Colts. I like the Colts defense personally. Uh, I think it's a good spot for him. And then the other one, since we're talking about defense right now, I like the 49ers defense uh, quite a bit. They, they gave up a lot of points to Kansas City. Now they're playing a Rams team that, frankly, isn't very good. Near the bottom of the league in pretty much every offensive metric, running backs and shambles. Uh, it, it's a game that San Francisco really must win. And mm -hmm. I say must win is they can win the division, basically, if they win this week. They, they steal this win against the Rams. Seattle has all they can handle potentially with the Giants. Uh, all of a sudden, it's their division if they can just squeak through this week here. So... The 49ers, uh, the Colts, and the Patriots are my three defenses that I really love. Okay. Let's tra that's that's the whole slate. Let's change this and transition right to the cheat sheet. And hopefully we can get these likes up a little bit. We have so many people watching, but we only have bordering on 70 yeah. likes. Let's go right to the cheat sheet, Mike. Yeah, I know. It's it's a little disappointing. I just feel like it's like such an easy thing to do. I'm a little disappointed in you all, but you guys will make it up to me. You guys and girls will make it up to me. Um, I, let me start with my cheat sheet. Um, and then we can go to yours, and then we'll we'll figure out the uh, the top three at each position. My stack is Kyler to D-Hop. And it's – honestly, I'll be honest, I do like it. But you kind of took the stack I liked. And I knew you would, right? Wow. You, in, so we'll, we'll talk about that in a second. But I do love Mike's stack. Uh, my value play is Marquise Goodwin. You know, I, I do think – we could see Marquise Goodwin get loose against this Giants defense. The Giants defense has been just fine, but they are an aggressive defense, and I think Marquise Goodwin is the guy, the kind of guy that can get behind a defense pretty easily. I do like Geno Smith as well. Uh, my chalk play is Raheem Mostert. So, again, we have to monitor the injury reports and make sure he's totally fine. He did pop up with a knee, so we had a limited practice today. I'm sure he's fine. I love his value at, at uh, 5,900, so do a lot of people. So give me Raheem Mostert there. Contrarian play is George Kittle. Um, I, I don't. Uh, you know, that's one of those where I'm hoping the volume is there for him. That it's sort of predicated on Debo Samuel being out. If Debo Samuel 
is not out, I, I would probably change that play. So it's just something to monitor. I don't think Debo is going to play. I believe San Francisco has a bye week next week. So I think it makes sense if he's iffy to perhaps hold him out. My fate is CD Lamb. It looks like he's picking up some popularity and I, I'm just I'm more interested in the Pollard side of that. I, I don't know where the passing game is going to be in this particular game. Mike, how about you? All right. Uh, well, I will start by saying I do like your stack, Tyler or Tyler Kyler to DeAndre Hopkins. I love that. Uh, but I'm going to it a Tyreek. Uh, not getting super cute with it. It's going to be pretty popular for a good reason. I think this is an absolute explosion game for the two. Uh, value play, Noah Fant. Uh, again, highly speculative. Uh, good news is, is the tight end position is relatively weak this week, so we get to speculate a little bit more than normal. Uh, but my speculation here is DK Metcalf is going to miss this game for Seattle. When he does, Noah Fant is more of a hybrid role, sees a few additional snaps and targets. Uh, so I like Noah Fant here. My chalk play, Alvin Kamara. I'm going to list mm -hmm. him as chalk. It's fringe chalk to not really being chalk, just kind of average ownership. I personally believe that after we talk about it, after we tout it on Sportsline, do whatever, that he's going to be pushed up into that chalk category. I love Alvin Kamara. I love him with Andy Dalton playing quarterback. I love him in a potential shootout here with the Raiders. Give me Alvin Kamara. My contrarian play, Jonathan Taylor. Jonathan Taylor, we know he's going to see handoffs. He's still not popular this week because of the price point, because of the other running backs on the slate. Uh, I think that it's going to be a heavy dose of him and Sam Ellinger together here in this spot. I, I like him. I think it's a spike game for him. I love what I've seen from him in the passing game. And then my fade, Damian Pierce. Uh, volume, hard to argue with it. However, don't think it's a great matchup. Kind of slow. Division game. Teams know each other really well. Going to stay away from this one on Damian Pierce. Yeah, and I'll be honest, my fade was also Damian Pierce until I saw that it was your fade. So I'm I'm in full lockstep with you on the Damian Pierce uh, fade. Okay, so uh, I want to touch on showdown real quick. I'll tell you what, we're kind of close to the 100. Um, keep hitting the like button if you can, but let's just go ahead and give your top three. And, and I'll, I'll hold them to task next Thursday during our game-by-game -game preview. I'll make sure they actually hit the 100. Give me your top three at each position. I think if you listen to this show, you kind of have a good idea of who his top three is, certainly probably at quarterback. Um, but let's yeah. start there and just really quickly run your top three quarterback, running back, wide receiver, tight end. Yeah, if you've listened, you know the answers here. QB, Tua, number one quarterback. Number two, Sam Ellinger. Number three, Kyler Murray. Running back, Alvin Kamara, number one. Number two, Kenneth Walker. Love his upside. Love the spot for him. And then number three, Tony Pollard. Listed as number three until we have a 100% status update that it is his backfield. Wide receiver, Tyreek Hill. Number one by a mile. DeAndre Hopkins, number two. And then number three is DJ Moore for now. Uh, that could change. Uh, as always, go to Sportsline. I'll have the entire player pool up there. But as of right now, it is those three. Uh, at the tight end position, number one, Noah Fant. Again, highly speculative at tight end position this week. Number two, Foster Moreau. Didn't have the big spike game last week. Think it's another interesting matchup here against the Saints. And then finally, Dalton Schultz. Uh, I had Dalton Schultz in a tournament lineup last week. Love him again this week just because things are still uncomfortable for Dak. I think that he's going to be that safety blanket, uh, especially with Zeke out. Pass protection could get a little iffy for him uh, because, as we all know, that's all Zeke is actually good at is pass protection. Uh, <laughs> Dalton Schultz is my number three tight end. And then my defenses. I misspoke when I told you my top three earlier. The Patriots are number one. The Seahawks are number two. And the Colts are number three. Okay. And by the way, as far as Foster Moreau goes, just make sure Darren Waller's not playing in that game. Monitor his hamstring issue, but uh, certainly uh, worthy of taking a shot at Foster Moreau if, if Waller is out. All right, we'll close the show with this, Mike. Um, the, the line in the Ravens game tonight, it moved from Ravens. I believe they were favored by one and a half or two, and it moved like three points towards Tampa. I think they're now a one and a half or two point favorite. Um, it looks like Mark Andrews is active and Rashad Bateman is active, but tell us why you think that line moved. Yeah, well, there's a couple reasons it moved more than I even told you pre-show. Um, you know, we'll start this look ahead line. So when we're talking look aheads, it's, you know, last week's look ahead here, right? The look ahead line was Tampa minus three. Tampa laid an absolute egg, did not play well, lost Carolina, right? That line shifted all the way to plus one and a half where uh, the Ravens were favored. Now throughout the week, it's kind of adjusted slightly back to when it was basically a pick'em. That's kind of the market moving back to where it should have been in the overreaction. 
What's interesting here is the status of Mark Andrews. He obviously had a terrible game last week dealing with a knee injury. What's interesting here is when you look at the sports books, you can't bet on Mark Andrews receiving yards tonight at this point. It is not on the board. It was on the board early in the week for about 30 hours at most at 58 and a half yards. What you can do, though, is you can bet on him in same game parlays. If you go build a same game parlay, they've dropped the yardage on him from the lowest number used to be 54 and a half. Now it is 44 and a half and they still allow you to play him. So what they're doing is basically allowing you to go build him in your same game parlays. He plays one snap or is limited. Those parlays are not going to hit. But what they will not let me do is go bet on his under for yardage at this point because they know they will get flooded with it. So if you're out there building same game parlays for tonight, be very careful with Mark Andrews in those parlays until you feel like you have a lot more information in terms of is he going to actually play? Will he be a decoy? Will we even know the true intent before kickoff? I'm not sure that we will. Uh, but some of that late news is definitely related to that. And we will talk about that late news, by the way, Mike, on the early edge tonight. You and me are on the early edge tonight with Prop Stars, with Jonathan Coachman, I believe with Alan Bell. That's 730 Eastern Standard Time on the early edge sports line YouTube channel. Definitely check that out because a lot of that news and, and sort of the props and the, the yardage totals and things of that nature, it's such a key indication of like what's going to happen in the game with these players. And usually we have that news by the time we start that show. We, we do it for Monday Night Football, Sunday Night Football, Thursday Night Football, and then we have a, a pre-Sunday main slate show as well uh, on the early edge. So catch us in just about an hour on that show. Uh, this is the, I mean, enough about early edge, right? This is fantasy football today, DFS. We've covered the main slate. If you have questions, I see some questions about players in the chat. Come over to the early edge tonight at 730 and ask those same questions. We will get them answered. This has been the Thursday game by game preview. That's Mike McClure. I am seeing a job. This is fantasy football today, DFS. And we'll see you on Tuesday for the lineup recap and the early look at week nine. Until then.